การกระเป๋าตังดูหายว่ามองเห็นปะไม่เห็นนะถ้าคิดว่าอยู่ติกูมุงมีลักฐานหรือเปล่าสถิติการ์ดอินเฟอเรนซ์คือเรื่องของการตัดข้อความหรือการตัดข้อความเกี่ยวกับประชากรแต่ทุกข้อความที่มีอยู่มีแค่ข้อความเดียวเท่านั้นเพื่อให้ผู้ชมได้เห็นว่าคุณมีประชากรและคุณต้องการข้อมูลเกี่ยวกับประชากรแต่ทุกข้อความที่มีอยู่แต่ทุกข้อความที่มีอยู่ที่มีการตัดข้อความที่มีอยู่ที่มีการตัดข้อความที่มีอยู่ที่มีการตัดข้อความที่มีอยู่ที่มีการตัดข้อความที่ So what we do is we get data only from samples of that population. Then eventually, out of that data from the samples, we make inference or make conclusions already about the population using some probability techniques. It looks easy, but in reality or in actual research, it's not because since we only have data from the samples, the population information in reality is unknown. So what do we do? We may estimate the information of the population by getting what we call the point estimate. It is where we're going to get the sample mean, sample variance, sample standard deviation, or we may also construct an interval estimate at some confidence level, which is called as the confidence interval. And if you do not want to make an estimate, you simply guess. What? You hypothesize, and that is where hypothesis testing comes in. In hypothesis testing, we have two hypotheses that we're going to consider. The null hypothesis, which implies that the difference between the hypothesis value and the parameter is zero, which indicates that your guess and the true value of the parameter are equal. Thus, for simplicity, we will always make use of the equality in the null hypothesis. On the other hand, we have the alternative hypothesis, which implies inequality with the parameter, indicating that the true value of the parameter may be less than your guess. Or the true value of the parameter is greater than your guess, or simply that the true value of the parameter is not equal to your guess. And if you are using the less than or the greater than sign in the alternative hypothesis, it deals with what we call a one-tailed test, which indicates that the interest is only on one tail of the distribution, either on the left or on the right side of the distribution. And if you are using the not equal sign in the alternative hypothesis, it deals with what we call the two-tailed test. Which indicates that the interest is on the two tails of the distribution, both the left and the right side of the distribution. To illustrate further, suppose that the mean platelet counts of all the patients with dengue fever is 95 to 120 at 95 percent confidence interval, which shows that the estimated range, which is 95 to 120, has 95 percent probability that includes the true value of the parameter mu. So we may guess that the true value of the parameter mu is equal to 100. Equal to 150 or greater than 60. However, if the 95% confidence interval is 95 to 120, then probably our first guess, which is equal to 100, is correct. On the other hand, our guess, which is equal to 150, is probably incorrect. And our third guess, which is greater than 60, is probably correct, since 95 to 120 is greater than 60. Now, given this set of hypotheses, there must be other hypotheses which complement this hypothesis. Like in H1, for example, if your guess is 100, it may be that your guess is not equal to 100. In H2, if your guess is equal to 150, but given the 95% confidence interval, which is 95 to 120, then your other guess may be that it is less than 150. And in H3, if your guess that it is greater than 60, then your other guess must be equal to 60. Now note that in each pair of the hypotheses, one of them contains the equal sign. And these hypotheses that contains the equal sign are called as the null hypothesis. On the other hand, the other set of the hypotheses which do not contain the equal sign are called as the alternative hypothesis. Now it is said a while ago that if the alternative hypothesis contains the less than sign or the greater than sign, it deals with what we call a one-tailed test. And on the other hand, if the alternative hypothesis contains the not equal sign, it deals with what we call a two-tailed test. Now, given these pairs of hypotheses H1 and H4, which contains the not equal sign in the alternative hypothesis, then this deals or will undergo a two-tailed test. On the other hand, the second pair H2 and H5, which contains the less than sign in the alternative hypothesis H3 and H6, which contains the greater than sign in the alternative hypothesis, then this hypothesis deal with or will undergo a one-tailed test. Now, on the succeeding examples, we're going to construct the null and the alternative hypothesis and classify whether it deals with a one-tailed or two-tailed test. 
is the mean IQ of all the students greater than 120? The possible answers or the possible guess here is that the mean IQ of all the students is greater than 120. And another one would be that the mean IQ of all the students is equal to 120. And if the guess or the hypothesis is that the mean IQ of all the students is equal to 120, then that is the null hypothesis. And on the other hand, if the guess or the hypothesis is that the mean IQ of all the students is greater than 120, then that is the alternative hypothesis. And since the alternative hypothesis implies that the true value of mean, which is denoted by mu, is greater than 120, then deals with or will undergo a one-tailed test. Is the mean calcium in blood of all hypothyroid patients less than 2.1 millimoles per liter? It is possible to guess here that the mean calcium in blood of all hypothyroid patients is less than 2.1 millimoles per liter or equal to 2.1 millimoles per liter. And if the guess or the hypothesis is that the mean calcium in blood of all hypothyroid patients is equal to 2.1 millimoles per liter, then that is the null hypothesis. And if the guess is that the mean calcium in blood of all hypothyroid patients is less than 2.1 millimoles per liter, then that is the alternative hypothesis. And since the alternative hypothesis implies that the true value of mu or the mean calcium in blood of all hypothyroid patients is less than 2.1 millimoles per liter, then this also deals with a one-tailed test. Is the mean CD4 count of all patients with stage 2 HIV infection equal to 250 cells per cubic millimeter? One possible guess here is that the mean CD4 count of all patients with stage 2 HIV infection is equal to 250 cells per cubic millimeter, which is the null hypothesis. And another guess is that the mean CD4 count of all patients with stage 2 HIV infection is not equal to 250 cells per cubic millimeter, which is the alternative hypothesis. Now, since the alternative hypothesis implies that the true value of mu or the mean CD4 count of all patients with stage 2 HIV infection is not equal to 250 cells per cubic millimeter, then this deals with a two-tailed test. Now I will explain further about the hypothesis testing. Just note that the null hypothesis is just assumed to be true but is never true and that the alternative hypothesis is the one that needs evidence to be proven. Mung, kapaw tangko. Alay na. Kapaw tangko hen mai. Mai hen, hamaya. Kapaw tangko hai, hamijera. Mai hen na. In that scenario, we can see that one person got his wallet lost and eventually accused his friend for stealing his wallet. Now his claim that his friend stole the wallet is the alternative hypothesis. Ha? Huh? Tamaya! Because that is the one that needs evidence for it to be proven. And the null hypothesis is that his friend did not steal the wallet. Now we have two hypotheses here. The null hypothesis is that his friend did not steal the wallet. And the alternative hypothesis is that his friend stole his wallet. Now if sufficient evidence is found to support the accusation, let's say there's a witness who saw that his friend steal the wallet, or let's say there's a CCTV footage that shows that his friend steal the wallet, then the conclusion is that his friend really stole the wallet, or in other words, he is guilty. And we can see here that the null hypothesis is rejected. But on the contrary, if there is no sufficient evidence to claim that his friend stole the wallet, then the decision will be in favor of the null hypothesis, which implies that the null hypothesis was not rejected, or in other words, his friend is not guilty. And it is clear here that this does not imply that his friend did not steal the wallet. It is just there is no sufficient evidence to claim otherwise. And only God, of course, knows what really happened. Thus, when the null hypothesis is not rejected, it does not imply that the null hypothesis is true. It was just there was no sufficient evidence to claim in favor of the alternative hypothesis. In other words, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But if the null hypothesis is rejected, it implies that the alternative hypothesis is true because there is sufficient evidence. <laughs>
That is why in court, a judge will only conclude if the suspect is guilty or not guilty. And not guilty does not imply that the suspect is innocent. Now, if the null hypothesis is true and was not rejected, that is a correct decision. Of course, we don't want a true hypothesis to be rejected. And similarly, if the null hypothesis is false and was rejected, that is also a correct decision. However, we may encounter what we call a type 1 and a type 2 error. Type 1 error occurs when the null hypothesis is true but was rejected. Ouch! And similarly, if the null hypothesis is false and was not rejected, that is also an error. And we call it as the type 2 error. The probability of type 1 error is what we call as the level of significance, which is denoted by alpha. This is the maximum tolerable risk of incorrectly rejecting the null hypothesis. And by rule of thumb, it is either 0 0.01, 0 0.05, or 0.10. Although the most common is 0 0.05, indicating that we are allowed up to 5% risk when we reject the null hypothesis. Or in other words, we are allowed up to 5% risk when we claim in favor of the alternative hypothesis. We are also going to encounter the test statistic, which is considered as a numerical summary of a data set that reduces data into a single value. Meaning, for example, you have the sample mean, sample standard deviation, sample size, and your guess or the hypothesized value. Those four values will be summarized into a single value, which is called as the test statistic. And that may be in a form of a Z, a T, an F, or a chi-square, which is computed using some formulas. Eventually, test statistic will help us how to get the p-value. Again, p-value is the probability of obtaining a test statistic that is at least as extreme as the one that is actually observed given that the null hypothesis is true. And how do we compute this? We may just find the area to the extreme of the test statistic. On how do we write p-value properly is written as the probability of the absolute value of a test statistic, let's say z, t, f, or chi-square is greater than a certain value, let's say 1.5, given that the null hypothesis is true. Later, we will see that p-value is simply the smallest value for alpha in which the null hypothesis is rejected, or simply the probability that the observed values are due to chance. Just remember that the goal of the hypothesis testing is always to provide evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. However, it is always the null hypothesis first until the alternative hypothesis is evidently true. Now, let's proceed to statistical inference involving a single parameter which is mu, which begins with hypothesizing about mu. I've already shown this a while ago in the previous examples. Just remember again that the goal of the hypothesis testing is always to provide evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. But remember that only until evidence shows that the alternative hypothesis is true, claim first in favor of the null hypothesis. But then again, claiming in favor of the null hypothesis does not imply that the null hypothesis is true. The statistical inference about mu involves two tests, the z-test for single mean and the t-test for single mean, also called as the one-sample t-test. Just note that the z-test for single mean is used when the population standard deviation, which is sigma, is known, and that the t-test for single mean is used when the population standard deviation is unknown. That is why in the formula, you can see that the z-test makes use of the sigma, while t in the absence of sigma makes use of s, which is the sample standard deviation. And since the shape of the t distribution varies according to its degrees of freedom denoted by df, we also have to compute for the df, which is n minus 1, whenever we make use of the t-test for single mean. Note that these steps are used in descriptive cross-sectional studies. Now, let's have examples. Suppose that a researcher has conducted a study to determine if the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is equal to 80 pounds. He randomly selected 50 12-year-old boys and found a mean weight of 77 pounds. If the weight of the 12-year-old boys are normally distributed with population standard deviation known to be 9 pounds, can he conclude that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is not equal to 80 pounds? Test at alpha equals 0 0.05. To explain this, there is a researcher who wanted to determine whether the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is 80 pounds. So he gathered samples. He got 50 randomly selected 12-year-old boys and eventually found a mean weight of 77 pounds. 
and eventually maybe he became doubtful. So he is asking whether the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is not 80 pounds if the population standard deviation is known to be 9 pounds. So again, the researcher wanted to determine whether the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is 80 pounds. So he collected 50 randomly selected boys and found the mean weight which is 77 pounds. Can he conclude that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is not 80 pounds given that the population standard deviation is known to be 9 pounds? So given the scenario, the hypothesized mean is 80 pounds and the sample mean based from the 50 samples is 77 pounds and with the known population standard deviation which is 9 pounds. So since the question is simply asking if he can conclude that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is not 80 pounds, there are two possible hypotheses. One hypothesis is that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is equal to 80 pounds, and that is our null hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis is that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is not 80 pounds. Now to decide whether we're going to conclude in favor of the null or the alternative hypothesis, we're going to compute for what we call the test statistic, which is again a single value that is derived from all the values that are given. In which case, in this scenario, we're hypothesizing whether the mean is 80 pounds or not. And then from 50 12-year-old boys, it was found that the sample mean is 77 pounds and the population standard deviation is known to be 9 pounds. The question is, should we make use of the Z or the T-test for single mean? Now, since the population standard deviation, as stated, is known to be 9 pounds, then sigma is known, then we're going to make use of the Z-test. Now, computing for Z, we have X bar minus mu over sigma over the square root of N which I'm sure you're very familiar with since that is the formula that we made use of when we're trying to compute for the confidence interval. Consider here that sigma over square root of n is what we call the standard error of the sample mean. And on the numerator, x bar here is the sample mean and mu here is the population mean or the hypothesized value. And substituting x bar as 77, mu as 80, sigma as 9, and n as 50, we're going to have a value of z, which is negative 2.357. Now, how do we know whether we're going to conclude in favor of the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis given this? We have to compare that value of z on what we call the critical value, in which we were able to come up already with a table of critical values for z tests when we were discussing the normal distribution. Now, to make use of this table, we have to decide whether we're going to make use of the one-tailed or the two-tailed column. Since the alternative hypothesis contains the not equal sign, which implies that we're going to undergo a two-tailed test, thus we're going to make use of the two-tailed column. And since it's given that the alpha is 0 0.05, which is the most common level of significance, then our critical values would be positive and negative 1.96 indicating that the area occupied by the pink region on the left and on the right when added is 0 0.05, meaning this is 0 0.025 and this area here is also 0 0.025. That's why in R, we may compute for the critical value using Q norm 0 0.025, which is represented by this area, and 0.975, which is represented by this area since from 1.96 to the left is 0.975. These regions are both 0 0.025 since our alpha is 0 0.05. That pink region is what we call the rejection area in which if the test statistic is in that rejection area, then we are going to reject already the null hypothesis it's because evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis is already found. Now, the question is, where is negative 2.357? Is it in the area of rejection or not? That is in the area of rejection. Thus, our decision is we're going to reject the null hypothesis.
So what our conclusion is? Again, it's always the null hypothesis first until the alternative hypothesis is evidently true. But when the null hypothesis is rejected, it implies that the alternative hypothesis is true. Now, since our null hypothesis is rejected, it already implies that again, our alternative hypothesis is true. In other words, there's already evidence that the alternative hypothesis is true. So, we're going to write it as there is sufficient evidence that and then just state the alternative hypothesis. But in the event that the null hypothesis is not rejected, you're going to state the conclusion as there is no sufficient evidence that and then the alternative hypothesis. Now consider here that the conclusion will always be about the alternative hypothesis whether sufficient evidence is found or not. But keep in mind that the decision is about the null hypothesis. Is either you reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. Going back, since our decision was to reject the null hypothesis, again, our conclusion is that there is sufficient evidence that alternative hypothesis. There is sufficient evidence that the mean weight of the 12-year-old boys is not 80 pounds. Now, we may try to compute for the 95% confidence interval. Remember that to compute for the 95% confidence interval, we make use of the sample mean X bar and then positive negative 1.96 and then the standard error of the mean which is sigma over square root of n. Since our X bar is 77, sigma is 9, n is 50, then substituting those values, we're going to have 74.51 to 79.49 as the 95% confidence interval for mu. Now, the question is, hypothesizing that the mean weight is 80 pounds, is that most probably correct or not? Since the confidence interval is 74.5 to 79.49, then most probably 80 pounds is not correct. That is why the null hypothesis, which is mu equals 80, was rejected. Again, it's because the 95% confidence interval here does not contain the hypothesized value, which is 80. Thus, hypothesizing that mu equals 80 is most probably incorrect. Again, that's why the null hypothesis was rejected. So in other words, if the confidence interval includes the value of the hypothesized parameter under the null hypothesis, then the null hypothesis will not be rejected. However, if the parameter under the null hypothesis is not within the confidence interval, the null hypothesis will be rejected. Further, we may compute for what we call the p-value. Just remember first, that the area represented by the pink region here, when summed up, is equal to 0.05. Now, to compute for the p-value, we're going to make use of the test statistic that we computed, which is negative 2.350, and I'm making use of the positive and negative signs simply because we performed a two-tailed test. Now, computing for the p-value of positive 2.350, which is represented by this region, and negative 2.3570, which is represented by this region, we're going to have 0 0.018. It's because the area of this one is 0 0.009, as well as the area of this one is also 0 0.009. You may also compute that using R by simply typing P norm negative 2.3570, which is represented by this region, and 1 minus P norm, 2.3570, which is represented by this region. Or simply, you may multiply to 2, P norm of negative 2.3570, or 2 times 1 minus P norm of 2.3570. Now, since the area represented by the pink region, when summed up, is 0 0.05, and this P value here, when summed up is 0 0.018, notice here that the region represented by the p-value is smaller as compared to the pink region which is represented by the alpha, 
Thus, we can say that whenever that the p-value is less than the alpha or the level of significance, that indicates that the test statistic is already in the area of rejection. Thus, we reject the null hypothesis. Again, whenever that the p-value is less than the level of significance, which is alpha, it indicates that the test statistic is in the area of rejection. Thus, we reject the null hypothesis. We may consider the p-value as a measure of doubt about the alternative hypothesis. So when the p-value is small, then there's no reason to doubt about the alternative hypothesis because we know that what we got did not happen by chance. But when the p-value is large, then we have a reason to doubt about the alternative hypothesis. Thus, our claim will be in favor of the null hypothesis in the meantime. Again, our basis, if our doubt about the alternative hypothesis is small or large, our cutoff is the level of significance which is usually 0 0.05. Thus, we can see here that the probability that the observed value in which the mean is 77 happened by chance by just 1.8%. And relative to 5%, that is small. Thus, there is no reason to doubt the alternative hypothesis. So, our claim will be in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So, given the results, you may write it as there is sufficient evidence that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in this town is not 80 pounds. Then, write the p-value in parentheses. You may also write that the mean weight of the 12-year-old boys is 77 pounds, which is simply our sample mean or the point estimate. Then in parentheses, the 95% confidence interval. So note that when you write your results, eventually do not write anymore that there's this null hypothesis, there's this alternative hypothesis, there's this critical value and computed value, and then the null hypothesis was rejected and so on. Simply write the conclusion, the p-value, and you may also write the 95% confidence interval. And as you read and observe research journal articles, you will notice that what is stated is only the conclusion, a p-value, and oftentimes a 95% confidence interval. Within a healthy, balanced diet, a woman needs 2,000 calories a day. Suppose that diets of six random samples of women were recorded and shows a mean of 1,900 calories. Assuming that the intakes of all the women are normally distributed with standard deviation of 290 calories, do the data provide sufficient evidence that the mean intake of all women is less than 2,000 calories? Test at alpha equals 0 0.05. So we can see in this example, it's simply asking if the mean calorie intake per day of all the women is less than 2,000 calories. So our null hypothesis is that the mean calorie intake per day of all the women is equal to 2,000 calories. And their alternative hypothesis is that the mean calorie intake per day of all the women is less than 2,000 calories. Now again, to determine whether we're going to claim in favor of the null or alternative hypothesis, we have to determine whether we're going to make use of the Z or the T-test for single mean. Since it's stated here that assuming that all the women intakes are normally distributed with standard deviation of 290 calories. This indicates that this 290 calories is the value of sigma. Thus, we're going to make use of the z-test for single mean. Thus, our test statistic z will be computed with x bar minus mu divided by sigma over square root of n with the value of x bar as 1,900 mu as equal to 2,000 because that is the one that's being tested under the null hypothesis and sigma as 290. And of course, the value of n is 6 since it used 6 samples. Now, computing for the test statistic, we're going to have a value which is negative 0.8446. And again, we're going to compare it with the critical value. And since this is still a z-test, we're going to make use of the critical values for z-test. And we have to decide whether we're going to make use of the column for one-tailed or two-tailed. And since the alternative hypothesis is less than, this indicates that we're going to make use of a one-tailed test. Thus, our critical value is either negative 1.645 or positive 1.645.
Now, to decide whether we're going to make use of the negative or the positive value of the critical value in one-tailed test, we just have to consider the sign of the test statistic. Since we computed a negative value, it is just right that we're going to compare it with a negative critical value. Thus, our critical value here is that z equals negative 1.645. And in R, we may compute the critical value using Q norm of 0.05. Since we want to find this value of z in which its area to the left is 0.05. Now, just be cautious that if the critical value is positive, we're going to make use of the Q norm 0.95 since in that case, we're going to be interested on the right side of the normal distribution. So again, this value of Z makes this area to the left as 0.05, which is the same as, of course, the level of significance. And it sets what we call the rejection area. Next, we have to identify whether that value of Z is in the rejection area. Is Z equals negative 0.8446 in the rejection area? No, it's not. Thus, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is no sufficient evidence and then state the alternative hypothesis that the mean intake of all women is less than 2,000 calories a day. Now for the p-value, we just have to compute the area from z equals negative 0.8446 to the extreme. And we may compute that using r by simply typing p-norm and the negative 0.8446. And we will get 0.199. And what you must notice is that the area to the extreme of that test statistic, which is represented again by this region, is greater as compared to the area occupied by the level of significance. Thus, we see that if the p-value is greater than the level of significance, alpha, it indicates that the test statistic is not in the area of rejection. Thus, we do not reject the null hypothesis. And with p-value of 0.199, that indicates that the probability that the observed value in which the mean is 1,900, which is less than 2,000, happened by chance by 19.9%. And 19.9% relative to 5% is considered large. Thus, there is a reason to doubt the alternative hypothesis. And so our claim will be in favor of the null hypothesis. However, keep in mind that claiming in favor of the null hypothesis does not imply that the null hypothesis is true. It is evident that ammonia, a metabolic byproduct, is elevated in patients with liver failure or certain congenital enzyme defects. Suppose that a researcher wanted to determine if the serum ammonia is also elevated in patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma, a type of liver cancer. Based from 12 patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma, the mean ammonia in micrograms per deciliter is 76.90 with standard deviation of 8.57. Do the data provide sufficient evidence that the mean ammonia of all patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter? The normal range of ammonia is 20 to 70 micrograms per deciliter. Test at alpha equals 0.05. Consider here that the one being asked if the mean ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter. Consider that it's being tested if it is higher than 70 because the normal range is 20 to 70 micrograms per deciliter. And based from 12 patients, the mean ammonia is found to be 76.9 which is higher than the normal level. Now, if in case that the mean of the samples is between 20 to 17, then there's no need to perform any statistical test. And on the other hand, if the sample mean, let's say, is 12 micrograms per deciliter, then you have to test it with 20 instead of 70 since 12 is less than 20. Now, constructing for the null and alternative hypothesis, since again, it's being asked if the mean ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter, 
Then our null hypothesis is that the mean ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is equal to 70 micrograms per deciliter. And on the other hand, our alternative hypothesis would be that the mean serum ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter. Now again, to claim in favor of the null or alternative hypothesis, we have to compute for the test statistic. The question is, should we make use of the Z or the T test? All we have to do is to identify whether the standard deviation, which is 8.57, is a population standard deviation or a sample standard deviation. Since it's stated here that it is based from 12 patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma, then the standard deviation of 8.57 here is not any more sigma but rather the sample standard deviation. Thus, we're going to make use of the t-test. And as we notice, the formula for the t-test is almost the same as the formula for the z-test. Except that instead of sigma, we're going to make use of the sample standard deviation. And additionally, we have to compute for what we call the degrees of freedom, which defines the shape of the t-distribution, which is computed as simply n-1. And computing for that, our x-bar will be 76.90, mu would be 70, since our null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 70, our sample standard deviation is 8.57 and our sample size is 12. So computing for the value of T, we're going to have 2.789. And the degrees of freedom, which is DF as N minus 1, will just be 12 minus 1 or 11. Then again, we're going to compare the test statistic with what we call the critical value. And this time... We're not going to make use of the table for critical values for z-test because these values are exclusively for z-tests. And we have a separate table for the table of critical values for t-tests. Just take note that the table for critical values of t-tests does not indicate whether the critical value is positive, negative, or both. Just consider that for one-tailed tests, the sign of the critical values for T should be the same again of the test statistic, just like in the Z-test. And on the other hand, for two-tailed tests, all you have to do is to put positive and negative sign for the critical values. Now, since our alpha here would still be 0 0.05, and since our alternative hypothesis is greater than, which indicates that we're going to perform a one-tailed test, and with degrees of freedom of 11, taking a look at the table for alpha as 0 0.05 for one-tailed test, since again, this is a one-tailed test, with degrees of freedom of 11, so this is the degrees of freedom of 11, we're going to find a critical value of 1.7959. Should this be positive or negative? Again, since this is a one-tailed test and the value of T is positive, then we're going to make use of the critical value as t equals positive 1.7959. In which you may also find using r, but instead of using q norm, since q norm is used only for z tests, since the normal distribution uses the z scores, this time we're going to make use of qt. So qt and then 0.95, and then the degrees of freedom, which is 11. The reason for 0.95 is because we're after the right side of the T distribution. Since this is positive, we know that the critical value is somewhere on the right, in which this area here is 0.95 to make this area as 0.05. Since we have the degrees of freedom of 11, so the critical value again is positive 1.7959, which is represented by the blue line here in which the area of this pink region is 0 0.05. Now, we simply have to locate whether the test statistic is in this area, which again is called as the rejection area, or not. 2.789 is in the area of rejection. And since it is in the area of rejection, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is sufficient evidence and then claim the alternative hypothesis.
So there is sufficient evidence that the mean serum ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter. Now to compute for the p-value, we know that the p-value is the one that is from the test statistic to the extreme, so this one, and expect that is less than 0 0.05 since we know that this is the alpha, which is 0 0.05, and this region is relatively smaller as compared to that. And again, we rejected the null hypothesis because when the null hypothesis is rejected, that indicates that the p-value is less than 0 0.05. So calculating for that p-value, which we know is less than 0 0.05, all we have to do is to take a look at r and then instead of 1 minus p-norm, since this is to the right, Instead, we're going to make use of 1 minus PT. So 1 minus PT and then the value 2.789. Then comma and then the degrees of freedom which is 11. And we're going to get a p-value which is 0 0.009. And with p-value of 0 0.009, that indicates that the probability that the observed value in which the mean is 76.9 in which, as we can see, is higher than 70, happened by chance by just 0.9%. And 0.9% relative to 5% is considered small. Thus, there is no reason to doubt the alternative hypothesis, and so our claim will be in favor of the alternative hypothesis. A study compares the complete blood count of dengue fever patients with the normal values. From 35 dengue fever patients, it was found that their mean RBC count is 4.65 and standard deviation of 0.57. Is there a reason to believe that the mean RBC count of all dengue fever patients do not differ with the normal values? Assume that the RBC count has normal values of 4.8 to 5.4. Test at alpha equals 0.05. So in this example, it's just asking if there is a reason to believe that the mean RBC count of all dengue fever patients do not differ with the normal values. Now, since the sample mean or from 35 dengue fever patients, the mean RBC count is 4.65, then we are going to compare this with the normal values and specifically with 4.8 since 4.65 is lower than the lower limit, which is 4.8. Again, if in case that the sample mean is higher than, let's say, 5.4, let's say 5.7, then you're going to compare it with 5.4. And if the sample mean, for example, is between 4.8 to 5.4, then you do not have to perform any statistical test. Now, constructing for the null and alternative hypothesis, the null hypothesis should be that the mean RBC count of all dengue fever patients is equal to 4.8 times 10 raised to 12 per liter. And the alternative hypothesis is that the mean RBC count of all dengue fever patients is not equal to 4.8 times 10 raised to 12 per liter. Since again, this is just asking if it differs or not, or in other words, if it is equal or not with the normal values. And again, since 4.65 is lower than the lower limit of the normal values, then we are testing it against 4.8. Now, to determine again if we're going to claim in favor of the null or the alternative hypothesis, we're going to decide whether we're going to perform a Z or a T test. And since there is no population standard deviation given, indicating that the population standard deviation is unknown, and we're going to make use of the standard deviation 0.57 which came from samples which are the 35 dengue fever patients. Thus, we're going to make use of the t-test. And computing for the t-test, we need the sample mean which is 4.65, the sample standard deviation which is 0.57, the sample size which is 35, and the hypothesized mean under the null hypothesis which is 4.8. We're going to have T as negative 1.557 with DF which is N minus 1 which is 35 minus 1 or 34. And of course, we're going to compare that test statistic with what we call the critical value. And taking a look at the table for critical values of T test, first, since this is not equal sign which tells us that we're going to perform a two-tailed test at alpha 0.05, 
with DF of 34. However, we cannot see a DF of 34, but we may approximate it using the last row here, which is infinity. So we may make use of the approximation of that critical value, which is 1.96. And since this is a two-tailed test, remember that the critical values for the Z and T test in performing a two-tailed test is positive and negative, then we're going to make use of positive and negative 1.96. However, if you do not want to approximate the value of those critical values, we may make use of R by simply typing QT, then 0 0.025, comma, then the degrees of freedom, which is 34, to get the critical value on the left side of the distribution, and QT, then 0.975, comma, then the same degrees of freedom, which is 34. Since again, we're particular with two sides of the curve, since this is two-tailed, so this has to be 0 0.025 and this also has to be 0 0.025 to come up with a sum of 0 0.05. And to get this value, this is QT and then 0 0.025 comma 34 since the area to the left here is 0 0.025. And for this value, we need QT and then 0 0.975 comma 34. It's because the area from this point to the left is 0 0.975. And of course, we have to compare the test statistic and the critical value. The critical value is represented by the blue line which is approximately negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Again, it's simply because the area here represented by the pink region is 0 0.025 to come up with alpha which is 0 0.05 when added up. Which sets the rejection area here and another rejection area here. So the question is, where is negative 1.557? Is it in the area of rejection? It's not. So since it's not in the area of rejection, so our decision is we're not going to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is no sufficient evidence that the mean RBC count of all dengue fever patients is not equal to 4.8 times 10 raised to 12 per liter. And for the p-value, we simply make use of R, by getting the area to the left of negative 1.557 and since this is a two-tailed test, we also have to get the area from t equals positive 1.557 to the right. And we may get those area by simply getting pt of negative 1.557 comma 34 plus 1 minus pt of 1.557 comma 34 or simply multiply to 2 this area here, which is negative 1.557, comma 34. And we will get a p-value, which is 0 0.129. And with p-value of 0 0.129, that indicates that the probability that the observed value in which the mean is 76.9 happened by chance by 12.9%, which is considered large relative to 5%. Thus, we have a reason to doubt the alternative hypothesis. And so our claim will be in favor of the null hypothesis. Now what you might have noticed is that the critical values of T when its DF is large, or in other words, when the sample size N is large, the critical values of T is the same as the critical values of Z. And this is because of the central limit theorem, which states that when the sample size is sufficiently large, the distribution of means becomes approximately normal. Which simply shows that if the sample size is large, the t-distribution becomes approximately normal. Here's a plot of the standard normal distribution in white and a t-distribution with one degree of freedom in red. And we can see that both distributions are symmetric about zero and bell-shaped, but the t-distribution has heavier tails and a lower peak. The exact shape of the t-distribution depends on the degrees of freedom. And a very fundamental point here is that as the degrees of freedom increase, the T distribution tends toward the standard normal distribution. So I'm going to let the degrees of freedom increase, and let's see what happens. And as the degrees of freedom increase here, we see the red curve getting closer and closer and closer to the white curve. Or in other words, as the degrees of freedom increase, the T distribution is tending towards the standard normal distribution. I've stopped it here at 20 degrees of freedom, and the curves might look close, but if we looked very closely, we would see that the t-distribution still has slightly heavier tails and a slightly lower peak. 
But if I let those degrees of freedom continue to increase, that t distribution is going to get closer and closer and closer to the standard normal distribution. Now let's perform example numbers 1 to 4 in R. Recall that example numbers 1 and 2 made use of the z-test for single mean, while example numbers 3 and 4 made use of the t-test for single mean. However, in R, there is no built-in function that will perform the z-test for single mean. Since the z-test for single mean, which is about hypothesizing about the true value of mu, or in other words, we really don't know the true value of mu, that's why we're just hypothesizing it, the thing is, z-test for single mean makes use of sigma, in which that is computed as the square root of the sum of x minus mu squared over n. So it is impossible for us to compute for the value of sigma if we really do not know the true value of mu. That is why z-test for single mean is not actually used in real-life data. So most often times in real-life data, we make use of the t-test for single mean. And the good news is, it has a built-in function in R. Now going back in example number 1 wherein a researcher has conducted a study to determine if the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys in his town is 80 pounds. You may open the file weight.rdata. And as you open the file, you may take a look at the data by typing weight. You may also take a look at its structure by typing str and then weight. And you will see that there is a column or a variable in which the column name is weight with capital W. And then to compute for its sample mean, we may just type mean and then weight dollar sign and then weight with capital W. And we may call it as x bar. And then we may assign sigma as 9 by typing sigma, arrow, and the 9. We may also assign an object name which is n for the length of the weight variable spelled with capital W from the weight file by typing length, then weight, dollar sign, and then weight with the capital W. And then we may also assign an object name which is mu which stands for the hypothesized value which is 80. And then eventually, we may just compute for the test statistic Z using the arithmetic operations in R by typing an object name, let's say Z stat, arrow, and then X bar minus mu in parentheses divided by, again in parentheses, sigma slash square root of N. And that will give us the value of the Z statistic. Then eventually, we may compute for the p-value by assigning again an object name which is p-value to be computed as 2 times p-norm and then the z-statistic that is just computed. And then for the last part, we may just compute for the 95% confidence interval by using x-bar plus q-norm 0.025 which basically gives negative 1.96 times sigma slash square root of n for the lower limit of the confidence interval. And it follows that we may just type x bar plus q norm 0 0.975 which basically gives positive 1.96 times sigma slash square root of n. And this will give the upper limit of the confidence interval. And we can see that the results starting with the z statistic will be the same as the one that we have just computed. And it follows that the p-value is the same which is 0 0.018. And since again that is less than 0 0.05, then we have no reason to doubt about the alternative hypothesis. That's why we rejected the null and conclude that there is sufficient evidence that the mean weight of all the 12-year-old boys is not 80 pounds. And then we may also check that the 95% confidence interval contains 74.51 to 79.49. Now moving on, let's have example number 2 in which the question here is that do the data provide sufficient evidence that the mean intake of all women is less than 2,000 calories? And since we do not have an R data for this, we have to start from scratch. So starting with assigning an object, let's say X, that will contain 1,700, 1,500, 1,850, 1,800, 2,300, and 2,150 using the concatenate function C. Then eventually, we may compute for the mean 
by typing mean and then x and then let's assign an object let's say x bar and for the sigma it is stated in the problem that it is equal to 290 calories as for the sample size we may just use the length function and then assign it as n and lastly we're going to assign mu as the hypothesized value in the null hypothesis which is 2000 and similar in example number one we just have to compute for the z stat using x bar minus mu in parentheses slash sigma divided by square root of n and that gives us the z statistic and for the p value since the one that we computed is negative and it is a one-tailed test then we just have to make use of p norm and then the z stat and it will give us these results, starting with the Z stat, in which that is negative 0.8446. And for the P value, that is 0.199. And since that is greater than 0 0.05, then we have a reason to doubt about the alternative hypothesis. That's why the null hypothesis was not rejected, and we claim that there is no sufficient evidence that the alternative hypothesis is true that the mean intake of all the women is less than 2,000 calories a day. Moving on, let's have item number 3, wherein the question here is that do this data provide sufficient evidence that the mean ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter? Assuming we do not have an R data for this, we just have to type all the 12 values using the concatenate function and assign an object name and let's call it as NH3. Then we may start by computing for the mean, the sample standard deviation, and the sample size. And unlike in example numbers 1 and 2 in which it made use of the z-test for single mean, which doesn't have a built-in function in R, number 3 on the other hand which made use of the t-test for single mean, and t-test for single mean has a built-in function in R, then we just have to type t.test and then the variable that we're testing if the mean is equal to 70, comma, and then mu equals, and then the value under the null hypothesis, which is 70. And instantly, it will give us the result of the t-test for single mean, also known as the one-sample t-test. Now, since we have a data for this, we don't actually have to type all the values using the concatenate function. We just have to open the file, which is nh3.rdata. And then we may begin by taking a look at its structure, in which you will notice that there is a variable name, which is nh3. And then right away, you may just type t.test, then the file name in which that is nh3, dollar sign and then the variable name which you can see in the structure function which is the same as nh3 comma and then mu equals 70 and then instantly r will give us the result of the one sample t test and as we can see here the test is statistic t is the same as 2.789 with degrees of freedom of 11 and as for the p value Although the one that we computed is 0 0.009 and R gives us 0 0.0176, keep in mind that R always gives a p-value which is for the two-tailed test. So if you are performing a one-tailed test, you just simply have to divide the p-value given by R by 2. So in this case, we just simply have to divide 0 0.0176 by 2 and that gives us 0 0.009. So again, R always gives a two-tailed p-value. So if in case you performed a one-tailed test, you simply have to divide the p-value given by R by 2. And again, a p-value of 0 0.009 indicates that the result in which the mean is 76.9 happened by chance by just 0.9%. And relative to 5%, 0.9% is small then we have no reason to doubt about the alternative hypothesis. That's why the null hypothesis has been rejected. And we concluded that there is sufficient evidence that the mean serum ammonia of all the patients with early stage of hepatic adenoma is higher than 70 micrograms per deciliter. Now, as for the 95% confidence interval, we know that if sigma is given using the normal probability distribution, 
we just have to make use of x bar plus and minus 1.96 sigma over square root of n to find the 95% confidence interval for mu. And we make use of positive negative 1.96 simply because those are the z-scores in which the area between is 0.95. Now, if sigma is unknown, then we will use s and it follows that we shall use the t-distribution. And similarly, we still have to use of x bar plus and minus, but instead of using 1.96, we have to make use of some values of t in which the area in between is 0.95. And then followed by the standard error, which is s over square root of n. And as for the values of t, we may find those values using the critical values for t test by simply taking a look at the two-tailed when alpha is 0.05. And as we can see, we may have different critical values for t, depending on its degrees of freedom. Now, since in this problem, our sample size is 12 and df is n minus 1, then we came up with a df of 11. So in the computation for the 95% confidence interval, we just simply have to make use of positive negative 2.2010. And substituting that value to the value of t together with the sample mean which is 76.9, sample standard deviation which is 8.57, and sample size which is 12, we're going to come up with a 95% confidence interval which is 71.45 to 82.35, which is the same as the 95% confidence interval given by R. Now, if your question is, should we really compute for the 95% confidence interval using this way without making use of the t-test function? Actually, it's not. It's because you may simply make use of the QT, then 0 0.025, and another one which is 0.975, comma, and then the degrees of freedom which is 11. That's why as we can see here on the formula, we have QT 0 0.025, comma, 11, and QT 0.975, comma, 11, because those functions give 2.2010. And then the other values, just like the mean, the standard deviation, and the sample size, made use of the mean, SD, and the length function. So using these codes in R, it will give you the same values, which are 71.46 and 82.34. Now do not be bothered with the very, very small difference between the actual output of R and our computed value. Remember, we are making use of 76.90 and 8.57 as the sample mean and the sample standard deviations which were rounded off in two decimal places. Now moving on with example number 4, wherein this is about the RBC count of all dengue fever patients in which the null hypothesis is that the mean RBC count is equal to 4.8 and the alternative hypothesis is not equal to 4.8. You may open the file rbcdenge.rdata and then you may start by taking a look at the structure of the file and then you will see there that there is a variable in which its name is RBC. So if we compute for the mean, we start with the mean and then the file which is rbcdenge dollar sign and then that variable, which is RBC. Then similarly, we may take a look at the standard deviation and the length or the sample size. Or we may go directly using the t-test function, so that will be t.test, and then the variable name, which is RBC, in the RBC dengue file, so that is RBC dengue dollar sign RBC, comma, and then mu equals 4.8 since that is our hypothesized value under the null hypothesis. And it will give us a result in which the t-statistic, as we can see, is negative 1.5833 with degrees of freedom of 34. However, our computed value was negative 1.557. So again, the slight difference of that, it is because we made use of the rounded off sample mean which is 4.65 and the rounded off standard deviation which is 0.57 and it follows of course that the p-value will have a slight difference in which the one that we computed as 0.129 but r gives us 0.1226 however if we made use of 0.129 or 0.1226 
that is still around 12% probability that the result or the mean, which is not 4.80, happened by chance. So relative to 5%, again 12.9 or 12.26 is considered a high probability that what happened is due to chance. So we should be doubtful about the alternative hypothesis and so our claim is that there is no sufficient evidence that the alternative is true. Or in other words, there is a reason to believe that the null hypothesis is true. Always remember that in hypothesis testing, it's always the null hypothesis first until we have sufficient evidence to claim in favor of the alternative hypothesis. And when do we say that we have sufficient evidence? When the p-value is less than the level of significance. Because the lower the p-value, the less likely that the results are due to chance. And that the level of significance, usually 0.05, indicates that we are tolerating up to 5% risk in making a decision in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Thus, when the p-value is less than 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis, and when the p-value is greater than 0.05, we do not reject the null hypothesis. I hope you learned the basics of statistical inference through this video. You may click like, you may also subscribe for upcoming videos. Thanks, guys!